in this beautiful building. Um, and uh, today, I want to talk about 64-bit ARM servers. Uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, see what's been going on in this space from the inside. Um, Softarn, the company that I lead, uh, was started in 2012, and we've been pretty much riding the wave since then. In 2014, we introduced the first production 64-bit uh, ARM server motherboard. Uh, that was based on uh, applied microsilicon. And then last year, we introduced the first production 64-bit ARM server complete system based on the uh, AMD Opteron A1100. And so it's been my pleasure to be able to talk with uh, lots of uh, people who run large infrastructures, small infrastructures, people who love ARM, people who hate ARM. And um, it's been quite interesting to pick up on some of the things that, that people say. And uh, so I had originally planned a deep tech talk um, and then I saw that Andrew Waffa was on after me, and so, um, so I've left all the deep tech to him, and I'd just like to give you a kind of state of the nation uh, and try to locate how ARM servers fit in the current server, enterprise, data center kind of firmament. One of the comments that uh, we, picked, we pick up repeatedly is, why on earth would you want to make an ARM server because x86 owns the server market. And to be honest, it's kind of historically true. There have been other players, but um, the market share of x86 is absolutely massive. It's kind of a little bit more than 99% uh, in terms of uh, CPU shipments. And in terms of revenues, it's 80%. So, People have been saying to us, why on earth would you, you try and compete in that market with an alternative architecture? That's a bit like setting out to tackle the north face of the Eiger. Similar comments that we've heard from people are things like, ARM will never beat x86 in the server market. Often people just kind of cut out the middleman and say, ARM will never beat Intel in the server market because Intel owns such a large market share of the x86 market. And as I've listened to uh, people offering those sorts of opinions, it's um, put me in mind of um, a story that I first learned when I was, uh, when I was uh, about this high. Um, it's one of Aesop's fables. It's the story of the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise, of course, is uh, slow moving, and the hare is very fast moving. And Aesop's two and a half thousand year old fable goes like this. Uh, the hare was very proud of being so fast moving, of being the fastest of all the animals, and was forever boasting about it. And so the tortoise, getting fed up of this, challenged the hare to a race. The hare, was, the hare knew that he was fastest. He was so confident that he was fastest that along the way, he had a little sleep. And uh, as he was sleeping, the tortoise passed him. Now, the kind of comments that I've picked up uh, from people looking in at uh, what's been happening in the ARM server space um, have a little bit of the flavor of Aesop's fable, the tortoise and the hare. What they're saying is something that sounds very much like the hare is faster and will win every time. Or perhaps the tortoise will lose because it's not a hare. So let's have a look at those arguments. First of all, the hare is faster and will win every time. And that kind of breaks down into some sub sub-arguments uh, or, or, or some sub-points that we'll look at. First of all, is the hare really faster? Secondly, if it is, will it always be? And thirdly, is the race about speed anyway? Well, let's start out uh, with the first of those questions. Is the hare faster? 
or in, uh, in more sensible geek speak, is x86 a fundamentally better server engine? Does it have a starting advantage which will take it all the way through when pitted against ARM? Well, it has to be said that both technologies have a track record of winning. ARM has undoubtedly been the key winner in the area of low energy, small size, and it's done incredibly well in that space. X86, on the other hand, has been the uh, silicon of choice for computation. If you, want, uh, if you want a really good computational workhorse, that's where people have gone. It's also been the, the virtualization engine of choice over the last few years. If you look at applications, uh, the, the, those particular distinctives have mapped onto um, different areas of success in the market. ARM has been fantastically successful in the area of mobile and, of course, in, in embedded systems. And I guess some of you have worked on uh, applications in that area. x86, on the other hand, has kind of owned the enterprise and the data center. And so ARM might be characterized as being great at lightweight applications and x86 at heavyweight applications. And I don't mean those in a value judgment sense, I, I mean them in a descriptive sense. Um, ARM has been the light go-to solution for mobile and embedded x86 for enterprise and data center. Now, of course, um, there is no denying the heavyweight credentials of x86. Moore's law has been an absolutely phenomenal uh, progression. Over a period of uh, 40 or 45 years, we've seen this incessant doubling of the number of transistors in the same, the same uh, chip space every 18 months or so. It's been really, really impressive. And um, I'd like to make it clear that um, just because I work with ARM systems doesn't mean that I'm an x86 basher. I'm not here to tell you how terrible x86 is. What I'm trying to do is to figure out where do the different pieces of silicon and the different architectures fit together in this space. Historically, x86 has prioritized computing power. Moore's law has been uh, not just a descriptive reality, but it's been a kind of ideology in the development of x86. And so there's been a massive focus on making it continue to be true. It's all about computing power. And so you could argue that in the development of x86, computing power has been prioritized over energy efficiency. It's been prioritized over cost efficiency been prioritized over footprint efficiency, and it's been prioritized, I would argue, over support for rich uh, 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 and plentiful I.O. support. If you will, computational muscle is x86's unique selling point. It's what we all think of. So now that 64-bit ARM has come into the market, um, how does it get on? How does it stack up against x86? If you look around at the various 64-bit uh, ARM silicon vendors and system vendors, you'll find claims for uh, Xeon class performance. That's a very, very broad spread from uh, Xeon E3 through uh, high-end Xeon E5. Um, but, from first-hand experience, I would say, yep, that's the zone that the current 64-bit ARM servers are in. Um, and of course, there's a range of different server silicons that are out there right now. It's probably worth saying that um, it's actually pretty impressive for first-generation silicon this is, this is the very first generation of 64-bit ARM server class silicon 
to come to market over the last couple of years is pretty impressive. First, first go out of the gate to get into that zone against a technology that's been maturing over a period of decades. It is, however, the case that although broadly I would agree from my own experience uh, and from looking at other technologies that are in the space that uh, today's 64-bit ARM uh, servers are in the Xeon class, it, it has to be said that the overall ARM server package profile is significantly different from the profile of an x86 product. They have different strengths and weaknesses. 64-bit ARM isn't a lightweight version of x86. It's, a, it's at least a middleweight, different product with a different profile and different strengths and weaknesses. And comparing the two is kind of an apples versus oranges activity. It's much harder than it may at first look to get a clear handle on how does this compare with that. If we think about the world of benchmarks, we're used to benchmarking silicon and uh, comparing between vendors, between processors. Um, and benchmarks are supposed to be an independent measure of relative performance. Of course, what they can also be is a stick to beat competitors. And uh, it's very easy uh, to, uh, to, to fix on some negative thing and to talk about that and ignore the positive things. Benchmarks, to be honest, are best for comparing systems that are very similar to each other, where you're essentially what you're benchmarking is the thing that differentiates them. And so most of the benchmarking work that most of you will have done involves comparing x86 systems with broadly similar x86 systems. But it can actually be quite misleading when um, comparing fundamentally different architectures and uh, looking at those without looking at real-world context. I predict over the, on the basis of what I've seen so far, I predict that over the next uh, two or three years, we'll see lots of benchmark trials pitting 64-bit uh, ARM against x86. And um, some of the uh, studies will purport to show that 64-bit ARM is better because it's uh, got this feature, which it has a better number, and other people will say that uh, x86 is better for the same reasons. And so people will pull out um, per isolated performance results, such as, you know, how, how does this cope with integer processing or floating point processing? What people are also starting to focus on is performance per watt, which is a really good, useful, real-world uh, measure. But actually, in the real world of the customers who I talk with, even that isn't enough. What what the people I'm talking with who run large data centers want to know about is how can I maximize my performance per watt while maximizing the amount of compute I can fit into a rack? And um, space, space occupied, is something that is not generally considered in any of the standard benchmark tests. Most people come to this um, discussion assuming a priori that, um, that x86 is the faster, more powerful, uh, in some sense, better enterprise piece of silicon. Uh, in Aesop's terms, it's as if they start with the assumption that the, the hair is faster and always will be. Well, if we accept the premise Let's uh, consider how long can x86 dominate in the data center? ARM, the uh, developer of the ARM architecture, 
for a long time has been predicting that that ARM would take a 20% market share of the server market by 2020. It's a pretty aggressive um, uh, uh, target. It's very interesting that ARM have, very, have recently upgraded that to predicting a 25% market share by 2020. What is it that ARM knows that the rest of us don't? How can we possibly see that much shift in the market uh, over the next uh, four years? Well, we need to look at the dynamics of the ARM ecosystem. Right now, there are uh, three x86 manufacturers, Intel, AMD, and Via, the three main manufacturers. On the other hand, in the ARM ecosystem, of course, ARM designs the architecture and then uh, licenses it to, uh, to partners who will take the architecture and develop and sell silicon. Last uh, news release from ARM, I saw it said that they had 1,348 active licensees. It's people who are taking the basic architecture design and trying to do cool stuff with it. In the enterprise class space, um, already there's a whole bunch of pretty serious players who've licensed the architecture and are actively working on it. I know of at least AMD, Applied Micro, Broadcom, Cavium, High Silicon, Marvell, Phytium, and Qualcomm. All of these people taking the basic architecture and then developing different products. Each product not identical to the others, but, um, but a significant, including significant IP developments as well. And it makes me think of, uh, of the famous essay and uh, then later book by Eric Raymond, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. I guess it's well known to people in this room. What uh, Eric Raymond observed was that um, once upon a time, software development was, um, was by default pretty much like the process by which you build a cathedral. There's a small team of planners who design it, and then a larger team of people who follow the, the, the design and build the product. Whereas what, what we've seen with the emergence of the open source community and with collaborative communities of developers is something that looks much more like a, a, a bazaar, a free-for-all, where lots of pe independent people working independently somehow nonetheless succeed in developing great software like Linux, uh, 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 like uh, OpenSUSE and uh, like lots of other things that you've worked on. Software development in the Bazaar model is bottom-up, it's a community product, but the community is incredibly good at finding optimal solutions within the search space. There's a kind of evolutionary principle. If there are enough people working away at it, some people are pursuing, uh, pursuing lines of investigation which look promising and end up not getting there, and other people find the right path to produce really cool software solutions. The bizarre model, uh, it has been observed, works best when the initial parameters are set for the community. Um, they're laid out, and so the community works within a set of given assumptions to optimize. It's interesting that the dynamics of the ARM ecosystem look kind of like that, because you have, um, you have ARM defining the search space, as it were, with each release of its architecture, and then the licensees are a, quite a large community that get out there and explore what you can do with it and how to find uh, optimal deployments of that architecture to solve real-world problems. Eric Raymond said, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. I suggest that's kind of what's been happening for quite a long time in the ARM community, both in the ARM community before the, uh, the emergence of 64-bit ARM, uh, but now also in that space too. 
And what we've seen in, the, in ARM world is that uh, the community gets hold of new architectures, it produces initial systems, it tries things out, some of them work, some of them don't work, but the community, working as a community, bizarre style, end up finding optimal solutions. And so we see, we've seen quite a number of tipping points where ARM has been adopted a little bit in certain market segments. And then something happens. Then the community comes up with a set of silicon solutions which are just right and which then quite quickly become the natural choice. The tipping point is reached. And so we see, and this is a very small uh, example, we see a kind of evolution in the ARM ecosystem where, for example, uh, uh, market penetration tipped in ARM's favor dramatically in the mobile space where it has more than 85% market share, in, in storage drives where it has more than 90% market share, and in wearables where it has more than 95% market share. Now, obviously, those, those are areas that play to ARM's historic strength, and these are historic examples. We're now in a new world where ARM has ventured forth into the heavyweight end of town. Um, but already, within the first couple of years of seeing silicon coming to market, we're seeing an incredible spread of different manifestations of 64-bit ARM. So for example, um, AMD is one of the licensees of the 64-bit um, ARM V8 architecture. And um, they have in the range the AMD Opteron A1120 silicon, which has four Cortex A57 cores. It runs at 1.7 gigahertz. It supports up to 128 gig of DDR4 memory, and it has two 10 gigabit, two, two 10 GBE ports. Um, and alongside that, only two years into the uh, to, to, to 64-bit ARM silicon being out there, we can see the Cavium Thunder X2 silicon, which has 54 custom ARM cores, 64-bit ARM cores, um, in a dual configuration, that's 108 cores. Each core running in turbo mode at three gig, supporting up to three terabytes of DDR4 memory, and um, with, with multiple I.O. port uh, options. However you would describe uh, the Cavium Thunder X2, lightweight is not a word that you would use to talk about it. And so we're seeing, this is, I'm not saying either of these are, are better or worse than the other, they're four different things. But already the community is starting to explore the space and to manifest quite different and interesting um, clusters of functionality, some of which are somewhat different from the clusters of functionality that you see in, uh, in x86 uh, alternatives. So I would contend that uh, the ARM licensing model facilitates efficient exploration of the space, leading to faster convergence on optimal solutions. And because of that, and because of my first-hand experience of working with this stuff, and seeing what we can do with it, uh, I would say don't bet against 64-bit ARM outperforming x86 uh, over the next few years. That's a personal opinion. I would, uh, I would also have said um, uh, don't bet on the UK voting to leave the European Union, but <laughs> hey. <laughs> Um, but what's the race about? What are we actually trying to do? Because a lot of the people that I talk to, journalists that I talk to who want to talk about 64-bit ARM out in the real world, they, they kind of start with the assumption that 
what I want to do building x86 x86 servers is kind of make slightly better x86 servers. But that's not what I'm trying to do at all. There are lots of different races, and different customers care about different things. First of all, there's the energy race. Energy efficiency has been a key part of ARM's competitive advantage from the very early days. It's kind of what ARM is known for, right? Um, and I would say, looking at the work that we've done on our own systems, and looking at work that other people in our peer group have done, I would venture to suggest that for many workloads, today's first generation 64-bit ARM servers deliver better energy efficiency than state-of-the-art nth generation x86 servers. I'm not saying that's true in every case, but it's certainly true in some cases. And there are already compelling reasons, in particular use cases, for deploying 64-bit ARM in real scale-out uh, uh, situations. A little side note, um, beware when talking about, um, about processor TDPs. Um, because, of course, um, when people talk about x86 CPU t TDPs, they, they're talking about the CPU. When people talk about uh, TDPs in the ARM world, ARM server world, they're talking about a lot more within that power envelope. So it's another of these apples with oranges uh, situations. You've got to compare like with like to get reasonable results. I would have to uh, observe that um, x86 energy efficiency is improving fast. Um, you know, it's, it's on the agenda now, and uh, I would be lying if I didn't say that. But it's also the case that 64-bit uh, ARM is just really on its first technology cycle. It's got a lot of scope for further uh, energy improvement, energy efficiency improvement as well. Next, we come to the space race. Uh, some people uh, are very keen on fitting as much compute as they can into as small a space as possible. Sometimes as much as they can into as large a space as they can. I think it's just, today it's just a fact that 64-bit um, ARM servers are smaller than x86 servers. You can just make them smaller physically. And so you can typically fit a whole bunch more in a, in a standard data center rack. Of course, the real question is, are ARM virtual machines smaller than x86 virtual machines? How many virtual machines can you fit in a rack? And not just how many physical servers can you fit in a rack? And because we're so early in the development of these products, um, the jury is still out on, on that. Um, then we come to the total cost of ownership race. This is very important to customers. Um, and uh, some people have responded to the fact that some of the earliest releases of 64-bit um, ARM server products have been perceived to be more expensive than x86. But actually, early releases of x86 new technologies tend to be more expensive than they are six months later. It's just a fact of how technology gets released. Um, my observation, having been intimately connected with the cost base of both technologies, 64-bit ARM and x86, is that in general, 64-bit ARM servers will tend to be cheaper to buy and cheaper to run than x86. One of the kind of puzzling things that, uh, that critics sometimes uh, throw in the direction of uh, companies who develop ARM servers is, um, is, is almost not worthy of discussion, but I thought I would say it because people have said it to me so often, uh, and that is, unless you can make an, a 64-bit ARM server 
which can outperform the very top of the range, most powerful uh, x86 server, then you shouldn't be playing. You shouldn't be in the race. Well, it's just kind of dumb because most x86 uh, servers that are selling well don't outperform the top of the x86 range. And the truth is we are still in the first generation of 64-bit ARM systems. They just started to ship last year and they're doing incredibly well for a first generation. It just isn't rash uh, rational to require them to outperform um, the, the pinnacle of a technology base that's been in development for, for decades. It is the case that vendors, including SoftIron, uh, are in the early stages of filling out our product portfolios. And we have a whole range of different uh, price points and functionality points that we're going to be filling out along the way. It's kind of natural that um, that the place where most people start is somewhere round about the middle or a little bit, bit below that because the first thing that has to happen with a new architecture is that people like you have to try porting applications onto, uh, onto the hardware and testing it before you can look at scale out with large big iron uh, deployments. What I would say is that 64-bit ARM has definitely hit the ground running. This is not a toy, it's not a flash in the pan. 64-bit ARM is here to stay and I work with it every day and I talk with customers who come to us looking for very specific things that they can get from 64-bit ARM which they feel that they're not currently getting uh, from other places. So watch this space, it's gonna be really interesting over the next few years to see how the market develops. So I said I wanted to talk about what observers or critics have been saying. One of the, th the first thing I've been talking about is when they say the hair is faster and will win every time. And I've tried to point out that, well, we need to ask by what we mean by faster and what kind of race do we think we're in anyway. And um, I've, I found some inspiration in the Bible which says the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. So um, I'll just leave that hanging as a thought for the morning. Um, the second thing, and much more quickly, is people have said things to us that, that kind of boils down in terms of Aesop's fable to the tortoise will lose because it's not a hare. And people have got so used to server equals x86 that it's hard to kind of disaggregate those thoughts. Uh, uh, and people keep saying, ARM will lose because it's not x86. No, ARM will lose if it's rubbish, but it's not rubbish. It has some pretty impressive things to offer. And we find ourselves talking with people in, the customer, in our customer group where it kind of feels like, actually, there are some races in which ARM has a distinct advantage. Because if you, look at, uh, uh, if you look at things, a typical x86 CPU is a powerful computer with some support for direct attached storage. If you want to increase the amount of storage you've got, you need to add splitters or you need to add extra servers. So as you add storage, you increase the number of motherboards that you've got to drive data into the storage media. And it seems to us, looking at, looking at this profile, that actually... For the storage application, x86 CPUs are typically over-specified for compute and under-specified for data throughput. If you look at 64-bit ARM, um, even if you concede that you have a less powerful computer, the systems that have been coming to market have got much more support for direct attached storage. They support, the, the, there's plenty enough compute to drive data throughput. And so you end up with a much better ratio of storage to servers. Actually, what we've found, and we've done extensive work in our labs, we're very excited about it, is 64-bit ARM 
is fantastic for storage. The SOCs are right-sized for compute and throughput to deliver optimal results. So what can you expect? You can expect 64-bit ARM to outperform x86 dramatically in storage. And later on in the year, we're going to be um, generally releasing some storage products which are currently um, uh, out in the market with beta test partners. And if you're interested in becoming one, then do have a conversation afterwards. We also find ourselves talking with people who love x86, but who say, as a matter of policy, we don't want to put all our eggs in the x86 basket. In fact, we've even come across people with very, very large infrastructures who say they have an ambition to, um, if possible, have a 50-50 a split between x86 and an alternative architecture. When, when we start hearing that, it sounds more like it's a tortoise race. Um, because uh, the hare, by virtue of being a hare, can't win in terms of providing diversity, diversification from itself. Um, but there's another kind of tortoise race in the terminology of ASOP, and that is the, the market segment represented by people like you. Because um, last year, ARM processors accounted for around 32% of the worldwide server market. Um, that says 15 billion servers, which is obviously a, a wishful Freudian slip. It's supposed to say 15 billion uh, ARM processors shipped. Um, uh, so that is a huge number of ARM processors that, are, that went out into the market last year. More will go out into the market this year and so there's a huge global community of ARM developers and testers working in a native ARM environment, wanting to test their code in a native ARM environment. We've um, tapped into this and, uh, and discovered the reality of it uh, after we launched our first 64-bit ARM server product, our Overdrive 3000. It's an enterprise class rack server unit. And um, we've been getting fantastic feedback from customers. And uh, it has been shipping with, uh, uh, with OpenSUSE on it. But um, I want to announce today that uh, from here onwards, Overdrive 3000 will be shipping with uh, OpenSUSE Leap. Um, it's, uh, it's in the box along with a bunch of other goodies so you can plug and play. Now, uh, people, uh, quite a, a broad range of customers have been developing on this for a lot of different market segments, uh, a lot of different applications, a lot of different packages, and um, they, the feedback we're getting is people love that it's a big, chunky, powerful machine with great I.O. and so on, but some people kind of don't want a rack uh, product. They want something that can sit on the desk and just be a single developer uh, a 64-bit ARM developer solution. And so today, I'm announcing the launch of Overdrive 1000. Uh, it's uh, right-sized for individual developers, and I've got one here to show you. There you go. As Steve Jobs would say, isn't it gorgeous? What's in the box? Well, it's a 64-bit ARM uh, with four Cortex-A57 cores. Uh, if you want more, just, just uh, move on up to the Overdrive 3000. 
but it's absolutely plenty for developing. Whoa, what happened there? That's what happened. Um, it's got uh, it's got some DDR4 RAM, uh, eight gig expandable to 64. There's a bunch of good stuff there. Um, also, we ship it with uh, lots of the tools that you use, uh, I guess a bunch of you use on a regular basis, in the box uh, from day one, so you can plug and play. And this is also shipping from the get-go with OpenSUSE Leap. So for both of those, um, we're pre-installing them with Leap. Really, and I guess I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, they have a really stable set of core packages, vast OpenSUSE ecosystem of third-party packages. And, and there's something more than that. Just in terms of the dynamics of the market, what we're seeing is SUSE is showing real leadership in supporting 64-bit ARM, and uh, we certainly want to encourage that, and we love working with those guys. So how much is this all going to cost? It's a proper 64-bit server, and uh, you can, they're available to order from today for 599 US dollars. <laughs> but you can't have my show and tell box. And, um, these are available from the website. Uh, it, it was going to be up and running and ready for taking orders, but um, I guess events on the world stage may have intervened and distracted my colleagues back home. Um, but uh, certainly uh, today you'll be able to place orders uh, for that product. Switch on, start work. One of the problems in the 64-bit ARM community is it's been kind of hard to get your tools ready to start work developing. And you have to fiddle about with boards or, 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 or spend a lot of money or use an emulator, for goodness sake, running on x86. Let's use a low-cost plug-and-play development environment. Here's a great thing about uh, the ARM V8 spec. If you're used to working in, with embedded ARM, for example, you'll know that there can be a bit of a nightmare sometimes moving from one system to another. The great thing about ARM V8 spec is it's consistent across vendors. What this means is that you can develop apps on a low-cost 64-bit ARM platform, and you'll find coherence across all of the 64-bit ARM servers at any scale. And that's why it makes sense to have uh, a, a development box that will allow you to write code which will run across the range of vendors currently operating and hopefully in future operating in this space. The emergence of convenient low-cost tools is an important step in the emergence of the enterprise class 64-bit ecosystem. So, winning the arm race. There isn't just one race, there are many races. It's all about workload optimization. It's all about getting the right technology for the right problem. One size doesn't fit all. For the foreseeable future, x86 and ARM will coexist. If, I, if I've sounded like I've been attacking x86, then you've misheard me. x86 is, a, is an honorable technology with a great tradition. But there's room for, for innovation, and there is room for diversification. It's an exciting time to be an ARM developer. Stuff is happening really quickly right now, and I predict that that will accelerate over the next two or three years. So let's get developing on new generation 64-bit ARM to figure out where it best delivers winning advantage. Come and join the bazaar. Be part of figuring out what 64-bit uh, ARM can do better than anything else in the world. Be the guy who wins the race. And ignore the critics who say that 64-bit uh, ARM uh, uh, isn't going to make it because it isn't the other guy. No, 64-bit ARM 
is what it is. It's a great technology with real strengths and real commercial advantages as well, and the race has barely begun. Remember the tortoise. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Norm? I am also very optimistic about the future of ARM, but I wanted to talk about another geopolitical issue. <laughs> um, most CPU manufacturers I recognize in your talk were US-based. A couple of years ago, the US put a high-performance CPU embargo on China. <laughs> Last week, the world's most powerful supercomputer, I think, was announced as a MIPS machine. MIPS and ARM are both very big players in China. Yep. Do you think the US embargo on CPU, um, high-performance CPUs, is having an effect on the Chinese market? And how do you see MIPS and ARM competing for the Chinese CPU market? Okay, well, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I, I may have sounded like a, an ARM fanboy, and I guess I am, but I don't work for ARM, so nothing I say has, uh, carries any weight officially. But um, one, of the, one of the great things about the, uh, the ARM model is that, um, I mean, ARM has Chinese licensees, for example, and um, I mean, I, I, I've been in Asia just recently, and um, I tell you what, it's getting a whole lot harder selling Western, in fact, it's really hard selling Western manufactured uh, enterprise computing technology into Russia. It, it, well, I, actually, no, I, I've been talking to people in Russia as well, it, Russia and China, for, for all sorts of reasons that we don't have to go into, but geopolitics is it, basically. Um, and so, the fact that we're seeing companies, you know, Chinese companies like High Silicon, uh, developing homegrown, trusted ARM-based um, uh, processors for homegrown, trusted servers, I think is going to drive ARM, or at least give ARM an opportunity which, uh, which is currently being lost to some other alternatives. And, um, you know, we've seen Lenovo buying uh, IBM server business, and there's a kind of um, Chinification of that for the home market as well. Um, I'm probably not the right guy to, 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 to go into any detail about the relative strengths in that point of MIPS versus ARM. Andrew can do that afterwards. <laughs> any other questions? No hands? Oh, right. Go the back. Uh, hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, if I would decide that I replace the PCs in my house with overdrive 1000, the PCs already run leap. So not use it as a server or a development machine, use it as a PC. Would yeah. that work? Um, well, um, obviously there are, there's a set of questions that, uh, judging by your shirt, I'm guessing that most of what you run is open source, right? So um, uh, obviously you have the, application level question of has it, has it been ported to, uh, to the ARM platform yet? Um, at the moment, it's, it, I guess it's best as a, as a development server. Um, uh, give us a few months. <laughs> but I mean, hey, try it and see. I mean, th this is a sort of community that, that we look to to um, to do the development work. We're Softiron is is basically a business to business company. We're not particularly focused. Although we've got a nice, cool, handheld product, we're not a B two C company. Uh, so that's not something that we've devoted a lot of effort to. There's one over there. Good 
Going slightly deeper into that last question, I just wanted to check, have you recently tested any PCI graphic cards on this system? Because I believe that SOC does not have any built-in. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can't give you an update on exactly what we've tested and what we haven't there. Um, it's a developer system. Um, but um, by all means, come and talk to us about what you want to test and we'll, we'll tell you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just the wrong guy to answer that question. One of the strengths of ARM has been that it's about licensing IP. Um, do we think we'll see a shift from, say, AMD in that direction? Say, licensing x86 IP cores? Do I think we'll see a change in what? Um, so the strength of ARM has been it's about licensing um, IP, not physical hmm. silicon. Do you think we'll see that in the x86 market as well? So the likes of AMD who are struggling severely licensing their core designs? Um, that, the option has always been there. And uh, I mean, there used to be an awful lot more x86 licensees, for example, and the, the number has reduced and reduced. Um, uh, I think how things play out over the next two or three years in the 64-bit ARM space might be a factor that affects decision-making for people in the x86 community to think about the next move. Um, and I'm, I'm eager to see how that plays out. On a more business-related question, do we get a discount for bulk buy? <laughs> well, there's always a conversation to be had, isn't there? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, it always depends how bulky the bulk is, but uh, I'm, I'm a Scotsman and I like to cut a, cut a good deal. So come and talk about it. I'm going to have to uh, head off towards the, uh, uh, the early part of the afternoon, but my, my colleague at the back, who's just about to stand up, um, would be happy to field uh, those kinds of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Last question. Okay, so I'm right now browsing your website and trying to find a way how to buy it, and it's not in your shop uh, yet. Uh, I guess it will be there tomorrow, or when we can start putting orders in. The, the guy behind you can answer that question because he's been checking while I've been talking. Um, Sorry, that's a little loud. Um, yeah, it'll be later on today, so probably about 5 p.m. today. Thanks. Okay, I want to thank you, Norman, for coming in, coming to this conference, and Thanks exciting very much. news.